Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The deadline for public comment of the draft Integrated Resource Plan of 2023 is fast approaching. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss likely stakeholder reaction. Hi Terence. Hi, when was the IRP 2023 released and what does it say? Well, it re was released, uh, ironically, not in 2023. It was released on the 4th of January this year. So it was already poorly named in that people were expecting for the whole of last year this document to be released. And it was knocked down the road many times. Uh, finally was released and um, it basically says that South Africa is going to remain the plan. says that it remains in a situation of load shedding until at least 2027. Um, and it will only get out of load shedding if the coal fleet recovers miraculously from its current EAF and if we add a lot, a lot more gas to power than was in the, the current prevailing version of, of 2019. So, and basically it comes to that conclusion through uh, using assumptions around basically what the demand will be and what, uh, what the supply can what supply can come on over that period. And it embeds certain things like car power ships, which we know have gone by the wayside. It embeds an Eskom uh, project of 3,000 megawatts of gas to power, which has been put in a determination, but there's been no uh, procurement process. And it includes technology costs that are you know, out of line with our procurement of renewable energy and battery storage in South Africa. So that's how it reaches a conclusion. It also has two horizons, uh, horizon one to 2030, and it has a second horizon to 2050. And in that second horizon, there's, there's an opacity around some of the constraints that have obviously seem to have been put in, but it's not stated in the document. So it, it limits solar PV, which we know we added something like 2,500 megawatts last year, but it limits it to a, a yearly build out of 900 megawatts. Where they get that number from, it's, it's unclear. It also has a very low build limit for, um, for wind of about 1,700 megawatts during that period 2031 to 2050. And it's really not clear from the document, but that is what it says. So basically, we can't get out of load shedding until we get the coal fleet recovered and we add lots of gas. And uh, it's, it's not clear whether that plan is based on a lease cost analysis. It's not clear what the constraints have been put around adding that capacity and why. For instance, you know, why there's a lot of, in the second horizon, concentrated solar power, which no one else is building in the, the rest of the world, and much less PV. So there are a lot of questions. So th it came out uh, late in January, named 2023, and then had a number of shocking I think, um, conclusions. The common deadline is 23 March, following what some view as an inadequate participation process. Yes, so uh, initially it was the end of February, 23rd of February, that was the initial date that was given when it was published. Uh, there was an initial expectation that there'd be public hearings, which is kind of the norm uh, with these sort of processes. And we've had now, you know, we have now, now that, well, we had a very limited period. It has been extended. The minister extended it to 2023, but there have been no public hearings at whatsoever. There's been two workshops that the DMRE have, they've been sort of top down top approaches where the document is presented and the public participation is really limited to questions. Now, this is a major dislocation from the current RP. So it's a major change. There's a lot of questions as to how government has arrived at this. So therefore, a, a much more thoroughgoing public participation process would have been expected. That hasn't been the case. We now have the deadline this week. Public comments are limited to written submissions. And so the written submissions are starting to trickle in. The initial comment to the plan was cool, but the formal reaction seems to be even more negative. That's correct. You know, the. As I mentioned right at the start, there were, these were quite dislocating uh, outcomes um, and co quite confusing for many stakeholders that watch this uh, electricity supply industry very, very closely. So it was a cool reaction. How could you? How can a plan that's supposed to, uh, you know, cover system ad adequacy or outline how we're going to have an adequate system, 
you know, cater or allocate for load shedding. That was, that was the immediate question that was raised. And, and uh, I think in those workshops there was some explanation given by the DMRE as thinking that, you know, we have to be realistic around the coal fleet EAF and the, the time it's going to take to bring in. But uh, that's not really the role. The role of the plan is to say, how do we add sufficient supply to, to you know, have a, keep the lights on and keep the economy going? So those, those questions were, were very, very seriously. But as you say, the, the former reaction that's now starting to come through and uh, there are a couple more days to go, or basically is really negative about the plan. It's they're basically saying it's inadequate. The, the technology cost assumptions used are from documents that are out of date that have bear no relation to what our procurement processes that we've seen in South Africa. and. The technology costs used for tec uh, technologies that um, that are marginal to the system, say, say like small modular re reactors or nuclear, they, they're taken from an RFI process, which is a non-binding process. It's, it's an unrealistic set of s assumptions. They're using no, no firm figures for adding, for instance, flue gas desulfurization, which will have to be added to the coal fleet to make it compliant for our, with our, our environmental emission standards. They have no, give us no visibility with regard to what the, how they treat carbon capture storage and utilisation. What, what is that going to do if we're going to keep the coal fleet going? Um, you know, so there's just so many questions around this modelling and uh, the way it was conducted. And uh, that, uh, that uh, I think the formal reaction is going to be extremely negative from stakeholders. The, the ones that have already been published are saying that this is not uh, there's no relation there's no visibility of what a lease cost plan would be what the policy adjustments have been embedded because there's obviously policy adjustments that have been embedded well i suppose the the ones that are clear are the ones that they've just said every determination features in the plan which is what you would normally do but some of these are quite questionable so there's just too many questions about this current version of the integrated resource plan of 2023 and there's going to be a lot of pushback uh, the, the big slump in the wind allocation to 2030 is, is, is a remarkable feature of the plan. Um, even though we're seeing in the private sector, the private sector are concluding pri private PPAs uh, around uh, wind, so and at definitely at better prices than are assumed in, in the document. And then these constraints that have been added, both in Horizon 1 and Horizon 2, they, they're totally opaque. There's no transparency as to how they arrived at putting caps on the, the wind and solar. And uh, yeah, so th there's just a lot of questions that are being asked and the reaction, formal reaction, I think government must expect is gonna be extremely, extremely negative. What will happen now? Well, now what, what is, what, there's something that should happen and what will happen. <laughs> so what will formally happen now is that the, the DMRE is then gonna digest um, these comments and then we'll republish the plan. And then that has to go through some sort of process of approval. It's gonna take quite long anyway, because they're gonna to have to plow their mind to very, uh, a very harsh pushback, I think, to, to what has been in, uh, written by them. They're then going to have to redraft it and then try and get it approved through an EDLAC process probably. We know that that in the past has taken years uh, to, for, to gain approval. But actually what should happen is I think it should be redrafted, um, taking in uh, to account some really you know, good work that has been done around uh, from stakeholders that have raised, I think, very legitimate questions around uh, the plan, uh, which is really lacks a lot of credibility and, and too many, on too many levels. So they should redraft and reissue, and we should therefore I think uh, one of the organizations, uh, ATA, has already called for, therefore, have a reissued one that, that goes through a thorough process of public consultation, including public hearings, and rather have less haste, more speed in this, because if they push ahead with what's in this RP 2023, I think that th there's potential for, for, for a legal case because of the irrationality uh, and the opacity around this plan. So what they formally supposed to do and will do and what they've committed to doing is probably not what they should do. They should really go through a whole process of doing a redraft, probably bringing in some very good 
independent system uh, planners. You know, Eskim's always played a big role in this. The MREs played a big role in the past, but there are many people that do these these RPs and understand how they should work and what they are about and what they are not, and bring in uh, those sort of uh, uh, independent people to redraft. I don't think it would take that long, um, and then reissue and have a, a thoroughgoing public consultation with hearings. Thank you. That's the second tag show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.